Our next speaker is Lauren Eggleston. Lauren is Save the Rivers program manager. Lauren grew up in the North Country and spent her childhood on the shores of Lake Ontario and the river. After earning her Master's of Science in Structural Geology and Plate Tectonics at the University of Alberta, she moved to Utah to work as a park ranger interpreting geology at the Bryce Canyon National Park. In 2018, she returned to New York as an environmental educator at the Mena Anthony Common Nature Center at Wellesley Island State Park. Save the River is fortunate to have Lauren on our team as program manager and responsible for our education programs and many environmental programs. Lauren? Thanks, John. I'm just going to share my screen. Can you see the start? Yeah. Okay. So today I'm going to give an update or an introduction for those of you who are new to this project on the DEC Invasive Species Grant. Uh, this is a three-year grant, it's in its third year, and we work in partnership with the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe Environment Division and the New York State Museum. If you were here last year, Jessica Jock gave an update on the first two components of the grant, and those are both research-based. This talk uh, will do an introduction and then focus on the third component, which deals with outreach and education. Before we launch too far into this, I really need to acknowledge that without our partners, there would be no project. So Jessica Jock from the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe and Dr. Denise Mayer from the New York State Museum and their respective teams have really made this happen. So thank you. And thank you also to the New York State DEC for funding the research. Okay, the purpose of the grant is to investigate the relationship between native mussels or unionids and invasive mussels, dracenids, in the St. Lawrence River tributaries. Hopefully over the last few years, you've picked up some information on mussels with us, but just in case this is new, we've got examples here. On the left, there are unionids. Examples of these would be heel splitters, elliptios, pond floaters. And on the right-hand side, there are dracenids, which are the zebra mussels and quagga mussels that most people are familiar with. Unionids have a pretty one-sided relationship with humans. We excel at destroying their habitat. We turn them into buttons, we pollute their waters, and we introduce native, or not, sorry, <clears throat> we introduce invasive species. So we've recognized that this is terrible, and now we're working to protect unionids, which are a keystone species. Um, the reason for the grant, North America supports the widest diversity and largest population numbers of unionids. They were once so abundant in the Mississippi River that they would harvest these mollusks by raking them in, much like we now rake leaves in the fall. Their population crashed due to overharvesting, just like the sturgeon, in the 1800s. Um, but the industry realized that they were putting themselves out of business and established early conservation efforts. Mussels rebounded, and then they were struck again in the late 1900s when the Dreisenids zebra mussels were introduced. Dreisenids outcompete, outeat, outreproduce unionids, and the unionids now exist in refuges found in tributaries of the major rivers. And this picture here just shows the unionids in their normal environment. Okay. So this is the area that we're working in. Um, on this map, we've got the St. Lawrence River, and then circled, we've got Messina, Ogdensburg, and Brockville, just to sort of orient you to the area. The next map shows the five tributaries that we work in, and they're highlighted. The four control tributaries are highlighted in orange, which are the Brandy Brook, the Sucker Brook, the Racket River, and the St. Regis River. The Grass River, where most of our work is done, is highlighted in red. And I'm gonna to move to the next slide to talk more about the grass. So um, hopefully you can see my mouse. So the um, Grass River kind of runs here by where it says Eisenhower Lock. So the grass is significant because of its location next to the Snell Lock, which is that block indicated in red. Um, this is the entry point to the St. Lawrence Seaway. You can see a picture of it up on the top. 
the snell alters water levels as it opens and closes and that alteration is actually powerful enough to reverse the flow of water in the grass river this has an impact dresanids and eunionids reproduce in different ways eunionids use fish hosts to spread their young through the waterways so you can see their reproductive cycle on the left um, in the dry senates, on the other hand, they broadcast their young uh, and spread them through the water currents. So in their juvenile state, dry senates will float in a water column and you can kind of see that on the right. Um, the reversal of water flow as the snail is opening and closing carries invasives much further upstream than they would otherwise be able to go in the grass river. The grass is also part of a designated Superfund site, which you can see here on this map from the EPA. The remedy area footprint is about 305 acres and it stretches roughly seven river miles. Um, for the Grass River, about 75% of the river is affected. And over the last few years, the grass has been dredged and capped uh, to remove or stabilize polychlorinated biphenyl contaminated sediments in the bottom. This is a dredging operation. Um, there are several of these when you go out on the Grass River. The dredging is important to this study because unionids require sediment that they so that they can safely burrow down into the sediment to protect themselves, um, whether that's from predators or from ice flows. Uh, capping the grass, in some areas they're using large blocky boulders and that drastically changes the current silty river bottom environment. So that led to the inclusion of this question, how does remedy substrate alterations affect mussels um, into the grant? Uh, and we really wanted to know not, not just how it's affecting unionids, but also how it's affecting the dressenids. So now we're moving into the research. Components one and two work to answer five different questions, which we'll go through in the next couple slides. And I'll try and break them down so that they're a bit more bite-sized. The first question is, does the existing lower grass river habitat function as a refuge for unionids from aquatic invasive species of the St. Lawrence River environ? So this one, um, we're looking to see if the grass river actually is a refuge for unionids. Um, on the left, you can see a picture of the unionids covered with dressenids. So this is kind of what we're looking for, if that interaction is happening here, or if the unionids don't have any dressenids on them. The second question um, deals with biocontrol. If, um, if there is this thing called self-cleaning going on and what we can learn from that if that exists. So native mussels uh, burrow deep into the sediment and in the grass river, it basically acts as a, an abrasive and it can scrape and clean their shells from those invasive mussels. So, in that photo, if those mussels burrow down in, it can actually um, scrape them off. It also, unionids can burrow deeper and they can hold their breath longer. So sometimes the dry sentence will release because of they they just run out of oxygen. So we want to know if this biocontrol is happening in the Grass River. And then if it is, how can we apply that to other places? Is it something to do with the sediment? Um, and is that sediment available in other locations? Uh, and then the photo in the center is Jay, who uh, is with St. Regis Mohawk Tribe and he's sorting through different mussels. Okay, question number three. Um, are there other tributaries with confluence to the St. Lawrence River that demonstrate similar unionid and dry sanded coexistence and self-cleaning behavior? So I guess I got a little bit ahead of myself here, but just, is this only existing in the Grass River, this self-cleaning, um, or is it also happening in the St. Regis? Is it happening in the Racket? Is it happening in other places? The fourth question, are dressenids recolonizing on adult unionid mussels in remediated and non-remediated areas the same? So for this one, with all of the cleaning that's going on with the Superfund site, as it's being dredged, will the unionids repopulate the Grass River after the sediment has changed? Um, will the dry sediments be as pervasive? Will it alter their relationship and that power dynamic between them? 
Um, will the anionids still be able to burrow as effectively? Will they be able to clean their shells from the dry sunids? These are all the questions that we're trying to answer. And the fifth question is how do we take this information and inform future habitat restorations? How does this study move beyond the Grass River, beyond the St. Lawrence, and move into any waterway with mussels? Um, we're trying to help mussels everywhere through this study. So all of that research makes component three possible. The fourth objective of the grant is dedicated to outreach and education. So the research happens and then we pick it up, we take the research and we communicate it out to the public. In 2021, we talked to about 900 individuals with muscle information, um, plus our online viewers, which I only counted each YouTube watch as just one, even though I know that some of those have been seen by classrooms. I just wanna to touch on the challenges and successes that we've had with this project. So the biggest challenge for us is the same that everybody faces and that's the pandemic. We'll get into that a little bit more on the next slide. Um, our successes include our distance learning program, our publications, community partnerships, our in the classroom and on the water programs uh, and an internship program. Okay, the pandemic. Everybody understands that the pandemic has caused all sorts of challenges and problems for everybody. Um, in seeking to be useful to useful and helpful to educators during this time, uh, our education committee identified early on the need for online programs and resources. We started crafting virtual field trips. We couldn't actually take the students out on the water, but that didn't mean that we couldn't bring an element of it to them. We wanted muscle related programming to be available for teachers, for guardians, or just go straight to the students. Our goal was to make it easy to use and adapt it to different situations, depending on where you are. Um, for teachers, we included warm up activities, videos, additional activities that would be accessible anywhere, um, as long as you had an internet connection. And then we made sure that the curriculum fit in with New York State standards. And then we put it out there for everyone, anywhere as long as they had that internet connection. Distance learning, we've all discovered, um, is not just limited to one platform. So at this point, we've done Zoom trainings, YouTube videos, Facebook posts, TikTok videos, and printed publications. Um, with Muscles, we're trying to hit a really broad audience, everybody from kindergarten to adults. And while we have focused areas and focused ages, broadcasting it to these multiple platforms allows us to reach that big audience. For printed publications, we have two publications out. The first one is the trifold for grade eight students and above. Um, this really points out the difference between unionids and dreisenids and informs readers how to help the unionids out mostly by being aware that we live on a water body that already has invasive dry sanids, um, but that a lake in the Adirondacks might not. And we want to stop the spread of invasive species and keep those lakes that don't have them that way. Our second publication is a 16 page booklet for grade five and above. You could probably stretch this one to third or fourth grade um, with an older person's help. Similarly to the trifold, it educates readers on the differences between the two muscle species. Um, it also has pages devoted to teaching the reader about that complicated history between unionids, dreisenids, and humans. Uh, the end of the book is dedicated to empowering youth to take care of their water bodies, take care of the water bodies near them, um, and also the creatures that live within those water bodies. So the booklet has had fantastic reception over the past year. Uh, in addition to handing them out during classes, they can be found all over. So here's a map that shows where the booklets can be found and also their future destinations. Blue is Save the River, the Save the River office. Yellow indicates an area where the booklets are currently or have been handed out relatively recently. And gray are locations that we're talking to and we'll be sending the publications too soon or they're already in the mail. Um, I just wanna highlight the ones, the, of the yellow ones, the Minneapolis Common Nature Center has been 
an incredible partner in this. The Nick Andrew Nature Center, the same. Uh, Zoo New York, we've been able to do events there. And then Han Memorial Library and the Indian Creek Nature Center. Um, we've been strengthening relationships and forming new partnerships throughout this grant. And community is everything. It's a, something that you've heard repeated through the talks today. It's a huge geographic area that we're trying to cover and it would not be possible without the support of schools, libraries, other nonprofits, parks, nature centers, and the zoo. Um, it's a lot of fun to get out there and talk about mussels. I was very skeptical at first when I started at Save the River because I didn't know very much about mussels, but it turns out that they are awesome. <laughs> um, in the spring, we did a virtual series with Han Memorial Library and the third installment was all about freshwater mussels. Around Earth Day, we went to the zoo in person and all the organizations that were there were incredibly happy to be there. Um, and the mussels successfully competed for attention against all of the furry mammals that kids could see at the zoo. Uh, we also had our first in-classroom program for the year at both seas in the spring. During the summer, oh, I'm sorry that Janet's photo is so grainy. Uh, during the summer, the pandemic seemed to release us and we were able to take outreach outside to programs like Tilt Summer Camp. Um, we also started filming more things to put up online, more virtual field trips. Uh, our education committee carried the muscle program to other kid-focused activity in the area and they did it through YouTube and, and in-person events. So that was really wonderful. In the late summer, we connected with Alexandria Bay School and attended their open house. That led to working with Emily Doerr's high school living environment class, which was a great opportunity. Um, we spent September working with them as they learned about different Uniades historically in the St. Lawrence River and then moved on to dress enids and the impact of invasive species. In the fall, we went to Autumn Fest, that's the top photo. <laughs> um, which is a popular event hosted by Wellesley Island State Parks Nature Center. And during this event, for both of these actually, we talked quite a bit about the Dreisenids and invasive species. Lots of people who attend the festival have boats and talking to them about how Dreisenids spread is really important. So getting that message out is, is uh, key. This winter, we've been make, making new connections for future programming and other finding other locations where we can host our booklets and our talks. Earlier, I talked about getting the word out through various platforms. Our intern, Chelsea, who will be presenting next weekend. Uh, she joined the crew last September and has been so important for getting the information out online. Her, her internship program really focuses on reaching middle school and high school students. She's been doing things like filming Fun Fact Fridays, um, which are available on TikTok and Facebook, and also through John's weekly updates. Um, fun facts range from information about the Great Lakes and spooky river stories to um, more like heavy fact information where you learn about mussels and what their impact is or why they're threatened. She also upped our Instagram game and um, contributing to all of these social media platforms where so many teens are influenced. So Chelsea also helped teach Alexandria Bay's living environment class in the fall. And um, she put together the curriculum package and the New York State standards that go with that program. Her focus isn't usually on K through five, but she does get to teach those kids at outreach events. So she's really hitting the full range of students. In the fall before everything froze, uh, Chelsea and I were able to get those living environment students from Alexandria Bay out on the water. So our on the water program is back. Um, and they were able to actually see mussel environments. This is a bit of a teaser for Chelsea's talk next Saturday. So I won't go into too much detail here, but it is a wonderful thing to take students out on the river, sometimes for their first time, and then have them make that connection between what they're doing in their labs, what they're doing in school, and what's actually occurring in nature. So what's next? This is the final year of the grant, um, but definitely not the final year of working together with St. Regis Mohawk Tribe and New York State Museum. We have a few months left on the project and we're going to do what we can when we can. 
uh, hands-on interactions are still pretty limited to when we can be outside and safely distance from each other. So when the weather gets a bit warmer, we will be right back out there. Uh, I know I thanked them in the beginning, but I just wanna highlight a few people who make our project possible. My thanks to Jessica, Jay, Colby, and Troy from the St. Regis Mohawk Tribe Environment Division. And thank you to Dr. Nunez Mayer and Kathleen from the New York State Museum. Thank you to the crew at Save the River and to the New York State DEC for making the grant possible. And thank you to all of you for tuning in. So I'm happy to take questions. And then I think we're not too far away from lunchtime. Lauren, thank you for that. I just, it isn't a question. Could you just speak for a minute about the importance of the, uh, the boat launch monitoring program that, that sure. TILT is running and how important that is? Yeah, so um, TILT, I forget exactly how many stewards it is that they have, but they have a really impressive network and they work together with Slilo and they cover a lot of North Country and their stewards are at the docks and they help people clean off their boats, um, whether they come in because they have, well, aquatic invasive species are not just limited to zebra mussels and quagga mussels. So if they have plants, um, if they have creatures, whatever it is, those stewards are really crucial to making sure that invasive species are not spread to other locations throughout the state and beyond that don't have invasive species. 